Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Displayed our list of news articles selected for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description and also in the comment section for the benefit of the viewers. Now let us move on to the analysis of first news article. This editorial article talks about the first Prime Minister of Independent India and the first Home Minister of Independent India. It is relevant for us to discuss this editorial as today, May 27, is the death anniversary of former Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. He died in the year 1964 and we also know that his birthday is celebrated as Children's Day as he was born on 14th November 1889. Now, before discussing this editorial, you should keep one point in mind. These kinds of articles are important from Maine's perspective as we may have questions on secularism, communalism, ideas on nation building, ideologies followed by leaders of freedom struggle, etc. Approaches of leaders have been earlier asked in examination, particularly Maine's examination. See, in the year 2015, they asked Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, despite having divergent approaches and strategies, had a common goal of amelioration of the downtrodden. Elucidate. In 2016, we had a question, highlight the differences in the approach of Subhas Chandra Bose and Mahatma Gandhi in the struggle for freedom. In 2006, in GS1, they asked the question, regardless of distance in time, there were lots of similarities between Lord Curzon and Jawaharlal Nehru discuss. So it is in this context we take this editorial that compares the ideology of Jawaharlal Nehru and Vallabhai Patel. Let us discuss the article from examination point of view. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this editorial article is highlighted here for your reference. The author of this editorial is of the view that in the current political scenario, Nehruvian ideology is projected as a myopic. That is, Nehru's ideology is projected as something that cannot be imagined or unimaginative or something that lacks intellectual insight. Jawaharlal Nehru was also criticized with reference to dilution of Article 370 of Indian Constitution as well. We know that the temporary provisions and the special status for the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir was abrogated in August last year. There was criticism that Prime Minister Nehru mishandled the Kashmir issue. And those who criticized also believed that if the issue would have been handled by Sardar Vallabhai Patel, then the results would have been different or been far better. They say this based on the fact that Vallabhai Patel was given the task of joining the princely states to the Union of India. Know that Sardar Vallabhai Patel was India's Deputy Prime Minister and the Home Minister during the crucial period that immediately followed independence. We know that he played a historic role in negotiating with the rulers of princely states diplomatically but also firmly and bringing most of the princely states into the Indian Union. Therefore, he has the reputation for his firmness and ruthlessness in some times. Now, in the matter of Kashmir's integration with India, the author notes that there was a friendly understanding between Nehru and Patel. So here Arthur attempts to provide clarity about the historical context and the time of Kashmir's integration with India. While most say that the decisions are the Prime Minister's decision, Arthur notes that the correspondence between Nehru and Patel during the crucial period captures a sense of mutual trust and friendship among them. For example, he notes that a letter drafted by Nehru, which was addressed to Sheikh Abdullah regarding integration of Kashmir, was sent to Sardar Vallabhai Patel for his examination or perusal. And one more thing to say that Patel also handled this matter along with Nehru and this was when the Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, Meher Chand Mahajan, was asked to come to Delhi to discuss the accession of JNK to India and according to the author, Patel was in charge in India at this time as Nehru was in the United States. And all this had led to initiation of administrative proceedings in the Constituent Assembly for Article 370. And according to the author, even minor changes in the draft of Article 370 were informed by Patel to Prime Minister Nehru. And know that even though a constitutional provision was added with respect to Jammu and Kashmir, it was because of Kashmir's geography and its implications for India's national security. And this constitutional provision was only deemed temporary by both Nehru and Patel. 
So by these points, author tries to establish that Nehru and Patel had the same view regarding Kashmir and they took the steps after proper correspondence with each other. So there was no mishandling by Nehru regarding Kashmir's integration. Therefore, according to the author, he implies that even if the task would have been carried out by Patel, the result would have been same only. Now note that though the instrument for accession was signed in October 1947 for Jammu and Kashmir, most of the legal statements, legal provisions regarding the special status, the constitutional order from the president, the document of Jammu and Kashmir constitution, these things happened in 1950s. We may say that upon this matter, Prime Minister Nehru could not get the opinions of Sardar Vallabhai Patel as Sardar passed away in 1950. But most of the things happened in 1950s pertaining to JNK. Then the author touches the main crux of this article that is about secularism. Here, note that the author tries to establish Nehru's sincere commitment to secularism. And his commitment was also criticized as pseudo-secularism, that is Nehru's secularism or Nehru's ideology on secularism is biased in favor of minorities. The author states that this criticism is marketed on the basis as if Patel and Nehru had divergent opinions on the meaning of secularism. Well, some historians say that there is no evidence to say that there is diverging opinions. The author says they meant the same thing regarding secularism, that there is one difference. Sardar's view on secularism is moderate. But Nehru was committed to keeping the government at a distance from religion. And this was clear from the historical fact. While there was a lot of demands from some traditionalist leaders to build Indian nation around a Hindu population or as a Hindu nation, Jawaharlal Nehru strongly opposed this idea and Nehru used every available opportunity to propound benefits of socialistic democracy and many a times reassured India's Muslim minority about their future in India and this is because Nehru felt that India needed to favor science and logic instead of orthodox religiosity he believed that education is meant to free the shackles of human mind and not to imprison the human mind in preset ideas and beliefs and according to the author, Nehru had the motto of cultivating scientific temper and nurturing the spirit of tolerance. And these are the foundations of Nehru's concept of secularism or Nehru's ideology on secularism. If you see Article 51A of Indian Constitution inserted by 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1976, it is fundamental duty of every citizen of India to promote harmony and the spirit of common brotherhood against all the people of India transcending religious, linguistic, regional or sectional diversities and also to develop scientific temper, humanism and the spirit of inquiry and reform. But in spite of Patel's moderate view on secularism, author states that Patel was sometimes or is sometimes identified as a Hindu traditionalist. It is because of some instances where Patel showed favorable inclination towards Hindu ideology. One of such instances was pointed out by author with reference to matter of reconstruction of Gujarat Somnath temple which was tabled in parliament. The temple was damaged by the army of Mahmud Ghazni in 11th century. When the matter was tabled, according to the author, the then deputy prime minister Sardar announced that the government would provide funds for rebuilding the temple. In the conclusion, author states that Nehru has dreamt for a modern India rising above sectarian politics and divisive forces and this modern India would have an ideal position on the world stage. Therefore, he states that in this manner, Nehruvian ideology continues to remain very essential even today to fight against communalism and to uphold secularism. So his idea on secularism is not something that is unimaginative or something that lacks intellectual insight. Rather, it is still relevant and essential. That is why the editorial is titled as Continue India's Tyrist or Love with Nehruvian Ideology. Now let's move on to next news article. This news article is with reference to Prime Minister Matsya Sampada Yojana. See, Matsya means fish and Sampada means wealth. Therefore, this scheme is pertaining to the fisheries and aquaculture sector. Fisheries and aquaculture sector is an important source of food, nutrition and even employment and income for India as this sector provides livelihood opportunities to more than 2 crore fishers and fish farmers at the primary level. And when we come to the value chain, it gives livelihood opportunities to more than 4 crore individuals. And here, when we say value chain, it refers to processing, other value addition, marketing, etc. 
So in order to boost this sector, fisheries and aquaculture, the union cabinet has approved the Pradhan Mandri Matsya Sampada Yojana. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. See, the main objective of this scheme is to bring blue revolution through sustainable and responsible development of fisheries sector in our country. For this purpose, they are going to invest more than rupees 20,000 crore and this investment will consist of a central share, state share and contribution from the beneficiaries of the scheme. And this scheme is to be implemented over a period of five years from the financial year 2020-2021 to financial year 2024-25 in all states and union territories. Now coming to the scheme, first and foremost, it aims to harness or leverage the potential of fisheries in a sustainable, responsible and inclusive and equitable manner. It aims to enhance fish production and fish productivity through expansion, intensification, diversification and productive utilization of land and water. Now another objective is to modernize and strengthen the value chain, that is to strengthen the post-harvest management and quality improvement. The scheme also focuses to double the income of fishers and fish farmers and also aims generation of employment opportunities. See, it's an umbrella scheme. It has two separate components. One is within the scheme, there is a central sector scheme and the second component is centrally sponsored scheme. If you see around 1,700 crores have been earmarked for the central sector scheme component and around 18,000 crores has been earmarked for centrally sponsored scheme. As an umbrella scheme, the Pradhan Mandri Matsya Sampada Yojana will give more focus or will give focused attention for fisheries development in Jammu and Kashmir, Ladakh, island regions in India, northeastern region and aspirational districts. This is to be achieved through area specific development plans. Now, who are the intended beneficiaries of the scheme? Fishers, fish farmers, fish workers, fish vendors, then fisheries cooperatives, then fish farmer producer organizations, then fisheries development corporations, self-help groups and individual entrepreneurs. Here priority will be given to persons belonging to the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes, then women and differently abled individuals. Majority of the activities under the scheme would be implemented with active participation of states and union territories. The scheme will create state program units, then district program units and sub-district program units also in high fisheries potential districts. The scheme will have cluster or area based approach with appropriate forward and backward linkages. We saw in the beginning that the scheme aims to strengthen and modernize the value chain. Therefore, the scheme will focus on infusing new and emerging technologies like bioflock, aquaponics, cage cultivation, then recirculatory aquaculture systems, etc. It will promote activities like mariculture, seaweed cultivation and ornamental fisheries. Here when we say mariculture, it refers to cultivation of marine plants and animals in their natural marine environment. One more important part of this scheme is that it aims to establish a national network of brood banks for all commercially important species. See, brood stockfish, these fishes are parent fishes from which young fishes are produced or fry and fingerlings are produced. Fry and fingerlings are terms associated with newly hatched fishes. See, a sound genetic base is important to maintain the quality or to improve the quality and reliable supply of healthy fry and fingerlings. For this purpose, brood banks will be very helpful. Then the scheme aims to establish nucleus breeding center for self-reliance in shrimp brood stock. Then it also focuses to use end-to-end -end traceability from catch to consumer. Then how to use blockchain technology in the fishery sector. Then also aims to bring in global standards and certification. And one of the salient feature of this scheme is that for the first time it introduces insurance coverage for fishing vessels. As a result, it also aims to ensure the safety and security of fishers at sea, then acquisition of technologically advanced fishing vessels for promotion of deep sea fishing, then providing communication and tracking devices and even bio toilets in fishing vessels. And one more thing is that during ban period or during lean season or lean period, the scheme seeks to provide annual livelihood support for fishers. Now to the question whether the scheme envisages any private sector participation, the answer is yes. In addition to participation of private sector, it also aims to include development of entrepreneurship, business models, promotion of ease of doing business and startups and incubators in fisheries sector.
and to increase the bargaining power of fishers. The scheme aims to collectivize fishers and fish farmers through fish farmer producer organizations. The news article reports that this scheme does not contain any component for immediate financial assistance or immediate financial relief to the fisheries sector that is hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. So these are some of the important points with reference to the analysis of this news article. We saw in detail about the Prime Minister Matsya Sampada Yojana. We saw the objectives, we saw the components, we saw the timeline, we saw how it is to be implemented, who are to be prioritized, which areas are going to be given focused attention, etc. Now let's move on to next news article. This news article is with reference to a clinical trial to test the combined efficacy of two antiviral drugs, Favipiravir and Umifenovir. The announcement was made by Glenmark Pharmaceutical Limited, which is a research-led integrated global pharmaceutical company headquartered in Mumbai. It has announced to conduct a new randomized open-label study to test the combined efficacy of these two antiviral drugs. On hospitalized patients of moderate COVID-19, see the possibility of arriving at a potential COVID-19 cure. And this clinical trial is to be called as FAITH. FAITH stands for Favipiravir plus Umifenovir Efficacy and Safety Trial in Indian Hospital Sitting. See, these two antiviral drugs have different mechanisms of action and their combination is believed to have improved treatment efficacy, particularly during the early stages of COVID-19 disease because it is reported that high viral loads of COVID-19 is experienced in patients, particularly during early stages of the disease. Now, before going for clinical trials, both the drugs tested in vitro meaning that the test was performed outside of a living organism wherein both antiviral drugs inhibited or worked against the viral infection and have shown efficacy. Now, favipiravir is an oral antiviral drug that was approved in Japan since 2014 for the treatment of novel or re-emerging influenza virus infections. It has a unique mechanism of action using that it inhibits viral replication. It is known for inhibiting RNA polymerase activity that is crucial or is required for viral replication. So simply we can say favipiravir works against viral replication. Now coming to umifenovir, it is another oral antiviral drug licensed for the treatment of influenza A and B infections in Russia and China. It acts against the viral attachment to cells and it acts as a viral entry inhibitor. It induces production of interferon. Interferon is a protein released by an infected cell to work for antiviral defenses or to prevent viral attachment to nearby cells. After the in vitro test, the Glenmark Pharmaceutical Limited is now thinking that combining two agents may have a good safety profile and could act on different stages of viral life cycle and may become an effective treatment approach to rapidly suppress the initial high viral load and also to lead to overall improvement. Under this study, patients will be randomized into two groups. One group will receive favipiravir and umifenovir with standard supportive care, whereas the other trip will receive only favipiravir with standard supportive care. With the treatment duration of 14 days, this clinical trial called as FAITH trial is to test the combined efficacy of these two drugs. So this is all about the FAITH trial. With this, we come to the end of the discussion on FAITH trial. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article mentions that Indian Prime Minister has reviewed the current situation on the line of actual control and the ongoing standoff with China. He has reviewed the situation with National Security Advisor, Chief of Defense Staff and the three service chiefs, that is the Chiefs of Indian Army, Navy and Air Force. We have been discussing about the standoff between India and China, particularly in the Union Territory of Ladakh and also in the state of Sikkim. And we have several times discussed also about the Chief of Defense Staff as well. So today let us focus our discussion with respect to National Security Advisor. See, there is a Cabinet Secretariat Resolution of 1999. This document stated that the National Security Council shall have a National Security Advisor who shall function as the channel for servicing the National Security Council. The first National Security Advisor is Mr. Brajesh Misra and he was also the Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister. 
But know that in 2004, the posts of Principal Secretary to Prime Minister and National Security Advisor were separated and the NSA continues to be a part of Prime Minister's office. And in the year 2002, the National Security Council Secretariat was formally designated as a special unit that comes under the direct charge of National Security Advisor in the Prime Minister's office. Now, National Security Advisor has a very important role or a pivotal role when it comes to formulation and implementation of national security policy. Now, because of the importance of various areas or fields related to national security, the National Security Advisor assists the Prime Minister on foreign policy, defense, atomic energy and also on space issues. And we have to know that National Security Advisor chairs two important groups called as Intelligence Coordination Group and Technology Coordination Group. Now, the role of Intelligence Coordination Group is to provide systematic intelligence oversight to take decisions on allocation of resources to intelligence agencies, to task intelligence agencies and to evaluate their output on the basis of feedback from users of intelligence. Now coming to technology coordination group, the purpose of this group was to oversee technical intelligence, tech int capabilities of intelligence agencies and it will also coordinate acquisition of new costly major strategic equipment or major strategic facilities and then it also works to maximize technical capabilities with reference to technical intelligence. Note that the National Technical Research Organization functions under the supervision of National Security Advisor. And the chairman of Strategic Policy Group is National Security Advisor. This Strategic Policy Group, it assists the National Security Council. In addition to this, recently in 2018, Defense Planning Committee was constituted under the chairmanship of National Security Advisor. Now this defense planning committee, it helps, it facilitates comprehensive and integrated planning for defense matters. It will analyze and evaluate inputs related to defense planning. It also draws a roadmap for defense manufacturing ecosystem and also brings strategy to boost defense export. So these are some of the important points with reference to National Security Advisor. We saw about National Security Advisor since the Cabinet Secretariat Resolution of 1999. Then we saw how the posts were separated and we saw about what are the important groups which are chaired by National Security Advisor and also about Defense Planning Committee. Now let's move on to next news article. This news article talks about a mobile application developed by a startup in Kerala called as Farco Technologies Private Limited. The application is called as BevQ, in other words, Beverage Q. It is a mobile virtual queue management application. Rather than getting physical tokens by physically visiting a facilitating point, this application works on a token system and based on the generated virtual tokens, queue will be managed in compliance with physical distancing norms. Therefore, it clears decks for the reopening of liquor outlets in Kerala. The news article states that Google has given its approval to this mobile virtual queue management application. Initially, this application was chosen among few other applications by a committee chaired by IT secretary with the Kerala startup mission. And then it was subjected to a two level testing by Indian computer emergency response team. And then it was forwarded to the Google for approval. In this context, let us see about certain or Indian computer emergency response team. See, it is in operation since 2004 under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, the objective being to secure Indian cyberspace. It provides incident prevention and response services and also security quality management services. It aims to prevent cyber attacks against India cyberspace and also aims to respond to cyber attacks and minimize damage and recovery time. Therefore, to reduce national vulnerability to cyber attacks and to increase security awareness among common citizens. For prelims perspective, it is important as it is the national nodal agency for responding to cyber security incidents. Certain has statutory functions as inserted in the IT Act by IT Amendment Act of 2008. 
it carries out collection analysis and dissemination of information on cyber incidents then it forecasts and gives alerts of cyber security incidents it takes up emergency measures for handling cyber security incidents and it also coordinates cyber incident response activities and it issues guidelines and advisories with respect to information security practices procedure prevention response and reporting of cyber crime so these are in brief with reference to certain now let's move on to next news article this news article reports that border roads organization has achieved a milestone in the construction of a strategic tunnel in uttarakhand which is part of chardam pariyojana the strategic tunnel in uttarakhand is located below the densely populated chamba town on the rishikesh darasu road nh94 the reason why we call this tunnel as a strategic tunnel is because it will provide faster mobility to troops and equipment to the border with china so the tunnel is expected to help troops and vehicles to quickly reach important places along the border with china such as nelong valley which is called as the ladag of uttarakhand now coming to border roads organization it's a leader in the arena of infrastructure development in border areas of the country working under ministry of defense in this context let us discuss about chardam project or chardam pariyojana see under this project border roads organization is constructing 250 km of national highway so as to lead to four holy shrines of uttarakhand In addition to this it also aims to improve and develop around 889 km of national highways to provide all weather connectivity to the four holy places in Uttarakhand now what are these four holy places see these are from west to east yamunotri gangotri kedarnath and badrinath char refers to four and dam refers to abodes or holy shrine or seats chardam refers to four pilgrim destinations yamunotri gangotri kedarnath and badrinath and traditionally the pilgrimage begins from the west and ends in the east so the chardam yatra it commences from yamunotri then proceeding to gangotri and finally to kedarnath and badrinath so each of these four sites is devoted to a specific deity if you take yamunotri it is dedicated to goddess yamuna as in the name itself Gangotri is dedicated to goddess Ganga. Kedarnath is dedicated to Lord Shiva and Badrinath is dedicated to Lord Vishnu. Now with respect to Yamunotri it is said that goddess Yamuna goes along with pilgrims to the high altitudes of Ravi valley and Kedarnath which is dedicated to Lord Shiva is also a part of Panch Kedar. So what is Panch Kedar? See Panch Kedar refers to five most important temples of Lord Shiva in Garhwal Himalayas in Uttarakhand. One of the temples is Kedarnath, others being Rudranath, Tungnath, Kalpanath, Madhmaheshwar. And of these Kedarnath is said to be located close to the source of river Mandakini. and coming to badrinath it is situated on the bank of river alaknanda it is said that lord vishnu had carried out meditation here and therefore the temple here in badrinath these are the four temples associated with specific deity collectively called as chardam now let's move on to next news article this news article talks about an interim arrangement arrived by the supreme court with reference to lg polymers factory in visakhapatnam At the factory a styrene gas leak was reported in the early hours of May 7 2020 and has killed 12 people and affected more than 1000 people in the nearby area on 12th May 2020 in our daily news analysis we discussed about this gas leak we discussed about styrene in detail the uses and health impacts of styrene and we also discussed legal provisions connected with the issue of manufacture storage and import of hazardous chemicals for more information we request viewers to have a look at this topic discussed on 12th May This news article is with reference to recent protests in Hong Kong. The chief executive of Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, Carrie Lam, says that there is no need to worry when it comes to the proposed measure of a security law being considered by China's national legislature. The news article also mentions that Hong Kong is a former British colony which was returned to Chinese rule in 1997. also relatively liberal civil legal and economic systems are followed in hong kong in contrast with much more centrally controlled and authoritarian system in mainland china in other words this is what we refer to one country two systems policy 
Now, we would like to inform our viewers that on 25th May 2020 Hindu News Analysis, we discussed in detail about the connection of Hong Kong with the British, with China and the present dispensation in Hong Kong. We discussed about Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984. Then what exactly do we mean by one country, two systems policy and the recent developments? For these areas, we request viewers to watch that analysis. This news article is in connection with virtual courts that were set up for trying petty offences in the state of Tamil Nadu. In connection with this, we discussed about e-courts mission project, services under e-courts, the current status. Then we discussed in specific about virtual courts and advantages of virtual courts in yesterday's Hindu news analysis. So with respect to these parameters, we request the viewers to watch yesterday's analysis with reference to the particular topic. You can reach the particular topic analysis using the timestamping available in the description of yesterday's video. This question is with reference to faith trial. The term faith trial often seen in the news refers to an international clinical trial led by WHO to help find an effective treatment for COVID-19. This option pertains to the solidarity trial which is an initiative of WHO. Option B, a clinical trial to test the combined efficacy of two antiviral drugs as a potential COVID-19 treatment by Glenmark Pharmaceutical Limited, a Mumbai-based pharmaceutical company. This option is correct. It is the right description of faith trial. They are going to test the combined efficacy of the two antiviral drugs called as Favipiravir and Umifenovir. Now this question is with reference to Indian Computer Emergency Response Team. They have given two statements asking which of the statements are correct. Statement 1. Certain started its operation in 2015 as the nodal agency for responding to cyber security incidents in response to the massive data breach of Aadhaar details from Unique Identification Authority of India database. This statement is incorrect. Certain started its operation in 2004 and the massive data breach of other details was reported in the year 2018. Now, second statement, it functions under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. This statement is correct. First statement is incorrect. Question asked for correct statement. Therefore, the correct answer is option B, two only. Now, this question is with reference to National Security Advisor. With reference to NSA, which among the following statements are correct? NSA chairs the Intelligence Coordination Group and the Technology Coordination Group. This statement is correct. Also note that NSA, National Security Advisor, is also the chairman of Strategic Policy Group that assists the National Security Council and the National Security Advisor is also the chairman for the Defense Planning Committee. Therefore, the second statement, Defense Planning Committee constituted in 2018 has been set up under the chairmanship of National Security Advisor is correct. Both the statements are correct. Correct answer option C, both 1 and 2. The Chardam project, sometimes seen in news, refers to a river linking project between India and Nepal to link four major transboundary rivers, a project under Inland Waterways Authority of India, which aims at the capacity augmentation of navigation on National Waterway 1, a project under Land Ports Authority of India for setting up of integrated check posts at major entry points on India's land borders, a project to improve and develop national highway leading to four holy shrines of Uttarakhand. The correct answer is option D. The four holy shrines are Yamunotri, Gangotri, Kedarnath and Batrinath. This question is with reference to Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana. Three statements are given. Which of the statements given above are correct? First statement, it aims to bring about blue revolution through sustainable and responsible development of fishery sector and to double the income of fishers and fish farmers. This statement is correct. Eliminate option B and option D. Now, second statement, it provides for insurance coverage for fishing vessels and also envisages an annual livelihood support for fishers during ban or lean period. This statement is also correct. Therefore, the correct answer is option C, 1 and 2 only. By elimination method, we easily arrived at the correct answer without worrying about statement 3 because we are sure that the first statement is correct. Now, coming to the third statement, it says it comes under Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, which is not true. It comes under Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairy. So the correct answer here is option C, 1 and 2 only. With this, we come to the end of today's The Hindu News Analysis. If you like the video, if you would have enjoyed the content, don't fail to click the like button and share this resource among your friends and those who are in need of such resources. And subscribe to the Shankarayas Academy YouTube channel to get notified about new updates.